Wilma Reska Gallery in Chelsea, New York for the unveiling of the U.S. Postal Service's Martin Ramirez stamp. The U.S. Postal Service honored the work of Mexican artist Martin Ramirez by placing five of his more than 450 dynamic drawings and collages on limited edition forever stamps. Although confined to psychiatric hospitals for more than 30 years, Ramirez transcended his own situation to create a remarkably visualized world free from the constraints of borders or time itself. Characterized by repeating lines, idiosyncratic motifs, and daring perspective, Ramirez's art benefits the emotional and physical landscapes of his life in Mexico with the modern popular culture of the United States. Although he worked mostly outside the art world in his lifetime, Ramirez is recognized today as one of the great artists of the 20th century. He was born in 1895 in a rural community in Guadalajara and died in 1963. This is for me uh, truly a proverbial dream come true. It's been eight years in the making and here we are at the Rico Moresca Gallery in Chelsea. And this is a, a tribute and it's uh, the first day of issue for five, Mart count them, five, Martin Ramirez forever stamps and it sort of marks the uh, I don't want to call it the, the culmination because it's really the, the very beginning of something new for us and for the artists and for the appreciation of Martin Ramirez on so many different levels I'm just in a dream and I hope I never wake up this is a ceremony, and it means that the words we're saying have a special um, gravity. It's like when I say, I now pronounce you, mm, or I sentence you to five years in the penitentiary. Oh, sorry. It's a big deal for me to be here, too. Um, this is a stamp. This is part of the... America, this is part of North America, this is part of this hemisphere. Every time this goes on a letter, something special has happened. In the art world, it's even more special maybe because we have a thing that we've terribly called outsider artists. If all of you have heard of that expression, blah, okay? My wife and I, my, I'll, who I'll introduce you to shortly, have both written, if we call art, artists like Ramirez outsider artists, we have to call ourselves insider artists. That that has to be the deal, and nobody would ever do that. I'm going to introduce a bunch of people but first I just want to give a teeny bit of background. I'm from Chicago. And among the first or the second wave of people to find Ramirez's great, great art was a woman named Phyllis Kine, who was a gallerist. And the artist Jim Nutt, a great artist that's alive now, that saw them out in California and found a way for, to buy them all. Did they make a fortune? I don't think so. But if they did, that's life. I don't think they did. Um, I want to also thank somebody that's not here, a curator named Elsa Langhauser, who was an early uh, advocate of Ramirez and gave uh, a number of really important shows. I can't even tell you how happy I am to be on the stage with Brooke uh, on my left, your right, who did the great epic uh, retrospective in 2007, I think, then in a way changed the world. She is one of the great forces for good in the art world, but I don't ever tell her I said that. <laughs> I, in a minute, I'm going to introduce just my wife, Roberta Smith, to say one sentence to you, but she is the co-chief critic of the New York Times, a much better writer than I am, uh, and I love my work. Uh, <laughs> In her review in 2007 of Brooks' great show, she wrote, 
that Ramirez is, quote, simply one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. That means he can hang in MoMA, the Met, the Whitney, any major museum next to any artist. Roberta Smith, can I ask you to come up just for one minute? She's very shy. <laughs> and this is a long ceremony, so I'm not going to, if you'd like to say just one word or two about Ramirez and speak into the mic. I didn't tell her I was going to do this. Surprise. Um, no, I, I mean, he quoted me. That's my basic opinion. Uh, when I, <clears throat> I first found out about Ramirez's work in 86, he was the first outsider artist I encountered, and that was because of Ilsa Langhauser, whom Jerry mentioned, who did this show at the Moore College of Art and Design in Philadelphia that I think was his first really serious museum retrospective. And I, she invited me to... Uh, contribute to the catalog, and I really thought he was like uh, the Donier uh, Rousseau for our time. Rousseau is an artist who was incredibly important to Picasso at the turn of the century. But when I saw Ramirez and then started seeing other artists, I really knew that the history of American modern art was not anything like we expected, or like, like anything like we knew and that we had many more great artists to contend with. And it's simply thrilling that he's leading the way to, I hope, many more outsider stamps, because he's among the top two or three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you madly. Uh, OK, before I start to introduce uh, the first official here, I really have to mention some honored guests. And it's part of the Ramirez family, which, again, there's many Ramirez families in this country that will someday get recognized, and it's a huge honor for me to mention just a couple of them here now. Uh, the granddaughter, Maria Reyes um, Ramirez. The grandnephew, Louis Gomez Ramirez. We need you, we thank you, I hope. Your blood changed the world. The, uh, the official stamp dedication part is now beginning. So the atmosphere in the room is going to change a little. So I want to introduce Joseph Corbett, who's the ch C uh, chief financial officer and executive vice president of the United States uh, Post Office. And as one of our nation's calling cards, we hope these new stamps will inspire more Americans to learn about Martin's life and the art he created from that life. And what a life it was. I was fascinated to hear about this. And some of you in the audience, if you don't know about his life, um, please listen carefully. Martin was born in Mexico in 1895 to a family of peasants and devout Catholics, two cultural references that would later figure prominently in his art. In 1924, Five, at the age of 30, he migrated to the United States to find work to help support his family in Mexico. Just two years later, in 1927, his property was destroyed in a regional war, and the conflict prevented him from returning home to his wife and children. By 1931, Ramirez had lost his job as a result of the Great Depression and was living on the streets. Eventually, he was detained by police. Either unable, we're not clear here, but either unable or unwilling to communicate, Ramirez was taken to a psychiatric hospital in Northern California, where he was initially diagnosed with manic depression and later catatonic schizophrenia. He was institutionalized in California for the rest of his life, including his life as an artist. This could have easily been the end of Martin's life. Instead, he defied both his environment and his diagnosis and during the last 15 years of his life, he used brown paper bags, scraps of examining table paper from the institution, and whatever materials were available to him to create the hundreds of drawings and collages which he is now known for. In doing so, Martin became one of the self-taught masters of 20th century art. Blending the emotional and physical landscapes of his life in Mexico with the modern popular culture of the United States, 
Ramirez's work is characterized by its repetitive and hypnotic lines, which give depth to his images. And I'm sure those of you who have a chance to see his art already, you, you understand exactly what I mean. One of the most frequent motifs was a rider on horseback, uh, while trains and tunnels figured prominently in his later work. Other favorite images included landscapes and buildings, churches and Madonnas and desert wildlife, motifs that he used repeatedly, though he altered the details to create enormous variety. And though his name remained virtually unknown in the decades following his death in 1963, Martin's work has become some of the most highly valued examples of outsider art, as Jerry mentioned in the beginning. Today, he joins the ranks of other famous artists, such as Norman Rockwell, obviously quite different from Norman Rockwell, but Norman Rockwell, George O'Keefe, William H. Johnson, and Frida Kahlo, who were, have also been honored on American postage stamps. Designed by art director Antonia Alcala, this new stamp pane features details from five of Ramirez's more than 450 drawings. I also want to remind you that these are forever stamps. I have to do that. I'm from the Postal Service. <laughs> so they'll always be good. We'll honor these for the life of the forever stamps for first class postage, no matter what the rate is when you actually use them. Quite an investment. Buy them up. <laughs> and when you think about it, this is quite fitting because like Ramirez's art and like the Postal Service's commitment to diversity, these stamps will last forever. If ever there was an event illustrating how much Martin Ramirez's posthumous career has skyrocketed into a new stratosphere, this is it. And that trajectory began with two projects in 2007 and 2008 at the American Folk Art Museum a museum dedicated to Ramirez and other artists like him, a museum that is as marginalized as the artist it represents. There is little doubt that these Ramirez stamps are the result of those exhibitions that took place almost 10 years ago, 10 years ago. So for me, it begs mentioning during this ceremony, which illustrates uh, that this ceremony illustrates the essential role of small, specialized museums, those institutions devoted to a deeper, wider, bigger, better history of artists and art making by honing in on one sliver of art history. Places like the Studio Museum of Harlem, the Museum of Art and Design, ICP, and the American Folk Art Museum. They're so crucial, and this event highlights why. Much like the museums that feature Martin Ramirez, he too has been marginalized by the art world for such a very long time. We misunderstood this man's story for decades. For example, if, like me and many of us in the room, uh, you are a longtime admirer, student, or scholar of Ramirez's indelible artworks, what you knew about him in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s went something like this. He was born in 1890, maybe 1888, maybe 1860, we don't really know. He was mute and schizophrenic for sure. This we know with certainty. He's from Mexico, but actually it kind of feels like he might be from Brazil, maybe even the Southwest of the United States. Again, we're not sure. He didn't consider himself an artist, absolutely not. And he didn't consider his activities as making art. This we also know for certain. And he never had a family. But because of those exhibitions at the American Folk Art Museum, which I had the privilege of curating, and because of the accompanying scholarship around those projects by my colleague and friend, the tireless and passionate Victor Espinoza, we have learned where Ramirez was born, and when he was born, and when he died. We have learned that Ramirez had a voice, that he sang, that he spoke Spanish, um, uh, that he was not mute. We've found out that he was indeed from Mexico. We actually learned exactly where in Mexico. We learned where he was born in Mexico, where he was baptized in Mexico, where the ranch was that he bought in Mexico, and where his family lived in Mexico. That's right, 
he did have a family. Why we thought for decades he didn't is a little bit bizarre looking back now. And not only did he have a family, he has a family. The projects at the American Folk Art Museum gave back Ramirez his life story. It was those two projects that invited admirers to understand him in a deeper and a truer way. Martin Ramirez in all his fullness and in all his humanity. And that deserves saying again in all of his fullness and all of his humanity. And now, this man, this artist, has a stamp. He has five. <laughs> it's a... Uh... It's really so remarkable and exciting because Martin Ramirez was a husband and a father who was eternally rubbing together two pesos to trying to provide for his family. So we should understand that we're honoring someone from the working poor on a US postal stamp. By honoring Ramirez, we are celebrating the disenfranchised in this society so distracted by the 1%. This is so remarkable and exciting because Martin Ramirez was a man who crossed borders solely to provide for his family like so many men and women around the world and on our borders did then and do now. Now in this refugee-laden time, we're honoring a migrant worker on a US postal stamp at a time when this continues to be, I know, right? At a time when this issue continues to be hotly debated. This is so remarkable and exciting because Martin Ramirez was an artist who resourcefully and cleverly and knowingly collected thrown away scraps of paper, who borrowed or swiped, not sure which, tongue depressors, who squeezed out flower juices, who found a way to make, use bread to make glue, and who came up with all of these solutions on his own in a non-art making environment to make art. And then he exhibited his artwork, suspending it from the walls of DeWitt State Hospital in order to share it for all to experience. Awesome. <laughs> so tonight we are celebrating working families. We're celebrating migrant workers. We're celebrating artists who persevere no matter what. Stamps do that. I mean, wow, United States Postal Service, thank you very much. I think that it is uh, very important to just uh, underline that uh, Ramirez was uh, in a psychiatric institution for over 30 years in the United States. And the fact that he is honored here today in such a way for us Mexicans is a motive of pride. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you very much for all of you for being here uh, today particularly to our host, Rico Maresca, from the Maresca Gallery. The stamps of Martin Ramirez serve as a direct window to the experience of the Mexican migrant that travels to the United States to start a new life in a new country. Like many Mexican immigrants, Ramirez suffered great hardship. As you may already be aware, this master of art saw the world in a very unique way and lived his last 30 years in this psychiatric institution where he created his most renowned work. As Consul General in New York, I follow closely U.S. migration uh, and the migratory policy. It is with less frequency that I have contact with such powerful first-hand testimonies that belong to the artistic realm like this one. Ramirez's work fuses elements of Mexican and American cultures and presents a personal perspective about the experience of being an immigrant in the United States. And for all of you that do not know, there are 35 million Mexican migrants in the United States. We are by far the first minority. We're going to be the first minority in New York City by the year 2020. And what we're doing here is working, working very hard, just like Ramirez did 
before he lost uh, his job because of the Great uh, Depression. Ramirez was sending remittances to his family in Jalisco. Ramirez was uh, working and uh, he didn't speak English. Well, it happens. That's why he didn't communicate and unfortunately, there are many Mexicans that arrived to this part of the country without speaking English. Sometimes they don't even speak Spanish. <laughs> the migrants that are in the tri-state area come from Puebla, Oaxaca, Guerrero, which are the poorest parts of Mexico. They speak Nahuatl, which is the language of the Aztecs. They speak uh, Mixteco, Zapoteco, Tlapaneco. And uh, just a few months ago, one of our migrants in upstate New York was stopped by the police. They shouted, stop. He didn't understand. They shouted, alto. He didn't understand. And he was shot. You know, we have to be tolerant with migrants. They come here just to look for a better life. They come here to work hard. They're not taking away the jobs uh, of anybody. They're just uh, doing the jobs that others do not want to do. And this is something that has to be... I want to say that uh, Ramirez has been, as it has been said by all the speakers that preceded me, an unknown artist, and I am very proud of the work that has been done to recover his uh, uh, art and to, for, to show it, to showcast it to the rest of the world. I am very, very proud, and I want to thank the U.S. Postal Service for doing this. It is for us a great, great honor, and I want to tell the Ramirez family, siéntanse muy orgullosos, sientan que su pariente finalmente ha sido reivindicado, por los 30 años que pasó encerrado por no poderse comunicar. Muchas gracias. You know, one of the things that I think is so significant about uh, the fact that the U.S. Postal Service has released five stamps with the artwork of the Mexican artist Martín Ramírez on them is that this is probably the first time that a non-academic an artist, an artist who is self-taught, has been represented in this fashion. And what uh, Jerry Salt said at the opening ceremony was so perfect. He said, every time somebody buys this stamp and puts it on a letter, it's important, it's revolutionary. Because artists like Ramirez are often on the margins of our conversation about art and culture. And a stamp kind of demands that we have to put them in the center, where a lot of us have been wanting them to be for a very, very long time. I think for me as an art historian, I really love the deer stamp. I love all five of them, but the deer stamp very successfully is uh, composed within the shape of the stamp, and so I, I like that one an awful lot. But they're all really great, and they're beautiful, and the Postal Service should be commended for this. It's just terrific. Could you just tell us what this stamp means to you? How um, do you feel about the stamp? What does it mean you? Es un, un honor muy grande. It's a very great honor. De ser, de, de tener esta, unas estampillas del arte de mi, de mi abuelo. It's a great honor to have stamps uh, made of her great grandfather's art. Of her grandfather's art. <laughs> Does she have a favorite? Tiene una of the stamps? Yes. Tiene una favorita de las estampillas? No, a mí me gustan todas. <laughs> she likes them all. <laughs> she likes them all. And, and did you ever think this would happen? Never. Never. It's an incredible honor and again the family is so overwhelmed and in awe and never in our wildest dreams would this be happening. To our what family. did they originally think of the art? The minute we saw them we were, you know, transfixed by by them. So this is just incredible. It's wonderful. I'm glad that so much has gone into the making of this. It's uh, really been a solid year in the planning, in the making, and uh, I'm happy that it's an overwhelming success. Everyone, all of the speakers, uh, were so incredibly moving today. I could, I could hardly believe it. 
I've, I've known most of them for a long time, and they spoke so eloquently about the work. It was as if I was hearing all of it for the first time. Any favorite? Favorite speakers? No favorite staff. Favorite stamp. Oh, boy. No, no. To pick a favorite stamp would be like picking a favorite child. It's just, uh, I, I think they're all created equal. The designer uh, did an incredible job. And when I looked at them for the first time, I thought, wow, this is pretty much exactly what I would have done. Martin Ramirez. Um, I originally discovered Ramirez's work when I was in grad school um, in 2007, which is simultaneously was when his family discovered his work. Um, and I thought it was some of the most breathtaking and beautiful work I'd ever seen. And knowing his history um, and biographical history uh, made it more compelling to me and some of the most significant work I've ever seen. And tell me, what do you think about this stamp? I am very excited. I think it's a testimony, or, um, a testament to outsider art being recognized as a mainstream art movement. I think that it uh, has something to say about uh, Mexican-American relations. And uh, there's something to be said about turn of the century uh, culture and how we progress and how we become more um, uh, humanitarian. Very interesting. Customers have until May 25th, 2015 to obtain the first day of issue postmarks by mail. Affix the stamps to envelopes of your choice, address the envelopes to yourself or others, and place them in larger envelopes addressed to Martine Ramirez Stamps, Special Events Coordinator, 380 West 33rd Street, New York, New York 10199-9998. After applying the first day of issue postmark, the Postal Service will return the envelopes through the mail. There is no charge for the postmark up to a quantity of 50. For more than 50, customers are charged 5 cents each. All orders must be postmarked by May 25, 2015. And I'm Crystal Hart reporting from Chelsea, New York. Hope you've enjoyed the show and thanks for watching.